Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna call this meeting of the Monroe County Council to order for Tuesday, April 26. I wanna note for the record that uh, we have counselors present in the Nat U Hill room. Uh, we are absent counselors Hawk and counselor Wiltz, who I am stepping in for as presiding officer while she is away this evening. So now that our meeting is called to order, I'm gonna move us to item number two on the agenda, the adoption of the agenda. And I'll say, does anyone wish to add, any counselors wish to add or remove an item from tonight's agenda? I do have some notes myself, but I wanted to open that up to other counselors. Mr. President Pro Tem, I move that we uh, change the agenda by removing um, item number, uh, excuse me, four. No, it's not four. It's, did this agenda change? It did. And so I can't, is this our? It's uh, item four and 10, I think, are the ones that we're yes, talking about. Yes, four and 10. Um, because uh, these uh, are better prepared at a following meeting. Second. Okay. And we've got that motion now. Do we want to specify that uh, that would be the May 10th regular session meeting? Would that work for both of those? It, do it doesn't matter. I mean, you don't, we don't have matter. to decide. We don't have to choose. Okay. So we have a motion to take item agenda item number four and agenda item number 10 and move those on to a future meeting. Any discussion on that? Yes. Uh, since there might have been some confusion, that is the commissioner's office number four and parks and rec number 10. Is that right. correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. That is correct. Just want Thank, to clarify. You. Thank you, Councillor Iverson. Any further discussion on that? All right, so we'll take that by a voice vote. All those in favor of tabling item 10, item four and 10 to uh, another session, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Move we adopt the agenda as amended. All right, that motion passed. We have a motion to adopt the agenda. Any? Second. Got a second. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none. All those in favor of approving the agenda as amended, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion is passed as well. Thanks everybody for getting me my first motion. I'll try to have a good flight from here on out. <laughs> Next up, we'll move to item number three on the agenda, department updates. Do we have any departments that wish to make an update at this time? They can either raise their hand via Zoom if we, TSD, I'll rely on you to tell me that, or anyone present. Oh, there are no hands raised. None. Okay. Any departments going once, going twice? Okay, we're going to move on then. Item four has been tabled. That'll take us to item number five, employee services. And before we get to this, I want to note, uh, before the motion is read from Councilor Iverson, some background on agenda item number five as a reminder to council and for public watching. This item was tabled from the April 12th regular session. Prior to being tabled, the additional appropriation request was amended and reduced from $123,457 to $41,152. And it's back on the agenda tonight. Councilor Iverson, please proceed with the motion. Of course, council, I move to approve the human resources request for an additional appropriation in fund 1000-0309 general fund HR in the amount of $41,152 in the services category. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. I am very happy to see that we're joined tonight by Elizabeth Sinsenstein, personnel administrator, and she has a PowerPoint to display. 
And I'll open it up to anything you want to say at this point, once we get that far point. TSD, if you have that PowerPoint, you can share it. A moment, please. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Good evening, Council. Uh, this this slide is just an overview of all the things that we talked about uh, at the last meeting. So uh, Fred Pryor is an on-demand training system for all full and part-time employees. There's uh, over 800 trainings in a variety of topics. And I highlighted some of the main um, uh, course topics or like uh, sections on the, the slide. Uh, the system uh, we're going to use to provide that training, uh, specifically one of the main things we need is a system that's going to uh, provide sexual harassment and workplace uh, safety trainings for employees and that uh, will, it will provide those things and help us to be able to track and um, maintain compliance for those items. Uh, the, the system will also allow us to upload our own Monroe County specific trainings like new hire orientation, internal controls. I did meet with department heads uh, at the department head meeting and they also were very interested in that part of the system. Uh, they have some ideas for how they would utilize that in their own departments. Um, this would be an immediate resource for department heads that uh, need to address employee performance issues um, so they wouldn't have to wait. They could address that as part of whatever um, process they have in their office uh, and would need to seek out additional training. Um, and then the, one of the main objectives here is to provide equity across departments, equal access to training uh, for all employees um, so that they have this as a resource. And then, like I mentioned, we did discuss this at the department head meeting on uh, last Thursday, and I sent out an email to department heads, and the uh, feedback was positive from, from everyone. And some departments talked with their staff in their departments, and they had a lot of good feedback from the employees as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to open this up to council questions and or comments. And I'm going to start on my right for any questions or comments. I have nothing to add. I'm glad to hear that our department heads were unanimous in their support. Um, yes, um, I think uh, for those of us who have studied budgetary practices for county council, we understand that new programs and new expenditures uh, that goes beyond uh, just something for this particular budget uh, year and this one does is for three years. It uh, should be brought up at our regular budget sessions and not um, spent uh, additional dollars now without it giving uh, full consideration of what other departments might need. Um, if someone has it in their budget that they want to um, have particular training uh, for one year, that, that's one thing, but this is for three years. And so for those reasons, I won't be able to support it, nor would I support any additional request as such as this, um, because it's just getting ahead of the budgetary practices ahead of the other departments. And I, I believe that's just an unfair practice, though I understand it's been used a lot lately. And I'm hoping that this council will recognize that that is not, not supposed to be our goal. When you, when you set through the classes that the state offers us, they make it very clear, we don't do it this way. Um, and we did a lot of that for county commissioners all last year. And so that they got their budgetary requests ahead of everyone else's. And um, so I won't be supporting that. Uh, I do think that um, 
different uh, methods of training individual departments. Uh, they could look to their own budgets to see if there's some kind of special training they want. Um, but anyway, it's just my thoughts on it. Thank you very much. I'm gonna to move to comments or questions on my left. I will comment that I appreciate uh, Councillor Hawk's concern about, about multi-year uh, contracts uh, for this and moving past the, the usual budget process. But I believe you said at the last meeting, Ms. Sinson signed that the cost was um, lower because we were um, blocking out a, a three-year plan and I'm all for lower costs. Uh, additionally, I think, uh, I think the opportunities for staff to grow their own skills uh, and benefit the county government and also themselves uh, as employees is, uh, is a very welcome opportunity. So I'll support this. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I would just like to say thank you for bringing this back again. Um, and I know one of the biggest things the last time was making sure that this is something that department heads are wanting and to get their input because we want to make sure all department heads are, are valued and, and understand. Um, so I thank you for doing that. And I'm glad to hear that it was feedback um, was positive. And so I do definitely uh, think that it is necessary and vital um, for the health of departments to have more of an equitable training. Of course, we all know like with cost and things like that, we have to be concerned about that as well. But in order to better our departments, um, I definitely think that this is um, vital and healthy and I will also support this as well. So thank you. Councillor Hawk, you had another comment? Right, um, but I did want to add, and this should not cost us anything, but it could cost us a lot if we don't do it. Uh, I've been asking around and Evidently, there's not been any uh, official um, training or exercises um, with county government to, uh, having to do with uh, fire exits or tornado exit or any of those other things. And we could get the fire department or and our law enforcement and so forth to come and help make sure that county employees understand what to do if there's a fire alarm. And they're not having that. And, I, and why they're not having that, I have no idea, but, but we need to correct that. Uh, it hasn't been that many years ago, I guess it has been several years ago, that we were sitting right here in this meeting room and a tornado was coming in and the sky turned green and we're all up there and the whole room is full of families. And they just kept on with the meeting. And finally, one council member said, well, I'm sorry, I can't hear you over the siren. And they just kept on with the meeting as if it meant nothing. And I got up and said, I declare this meeting to be recessed. We're getting out of here. But then nobody even understood where to tell people where to go. Somebody said, well, we should stand out in the rotunda. Well, can you imagine if the tornado came in and whipped around the rotunda? Uh, that's I don't know much about it, but I wouldn't want to do that. So I think that that is something, I don't know whether it's human resources should do it, whether we have our law enforcement do that or whatever, but it needs to happen and it shouldn't cost a penny. I believe we did just have a tornado uh, drill or review of the tornado practices um, a few weeks ago. Emergency management sent out an email yeah. and, and departments were supposed to address that with uh, their employees. And so I don't know about fire exits, I, but I, I believe that I, I just wanted to let you know that we did yeah. discuss tornadoes should recently. They, should, just like at the Youth Services Bureau, they have regular fire drills. Yeah. But we should have them here. Now, I know it's important to do that there because of the people that they serve. But routinely, we have members of the public here. So every member uh, and uh, during a meeting, we should have the person running the meeting to have right in front of them the exit and, and instructions. I don't care if they're on the door, people don't read that stuff on the door. So I'm just hoping we work together to make sure that happens. 
All right, thank you very much, Councillor Hawk. I'll offer some comments of my own. <clears throat> I think ongoing training, education, and skill development never stops. And I think in the current economy and market that we're in, it becomes even more paramount to offer everything we can to county employees to do just that. And particularly department heads who need to train people on whatever, whenever, however. Um, I look at all the brilliant department heads we have managing all the headaches they have. And I know that if there is a thing in an 800 course module that they can use to do that and offer that and retain and attract employees, more power to it. And as a teacher, I'm gonna have a bias towards that because if I want that for my students and my daughters, I want that for county employees. So I'll support this as well. Any further comments? If not, I'll go ahead and ask for a roll call vote on um, public. What's that? Public comment oh, is an appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. I'll open it up for public comment. Thank you very much. That is key. <laughs> Any there are no hands raised. What's that? There are no hands raised. No. Mm -hmm. Seeing no public comment, I'm going to ask now for a roll call vote. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Hawk? No. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Crossley. Yes. Motion passed majority five to one. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming back this evening. Thanks. We're gonna move on now to item number six. This is a request from the prosecutor's office. Councilor Iverson. Council, I move to approve the prosecutor's request for midpoint hire of the legal secretary reception and fund 1000-0009 general fund prosecutor and to simultaneously amend the 2022 salary ordinances account line 13023 legal secretary reception 35 hours comma c non exempt to midpoint higher status with an effective date of may 8th 2022 which is the beginning of a pay period second all right, we have a motion and a second for this item. I would like to invite TSD if we've got either Prosecutor Oliphant or uh, Beth Hamlin from the prosecutor's office with us. Invite them to share. Uh, we do not. We do not. All right. We want to hold this item. Okay, uh, may, may I address? Yeah. If you just look at the numbers, I mean, remember this policy is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's clear that this applicant, whoever they are, has considerably more than the three years of experience to be uh, transferred over and considered for a midpoint hire. I don't, I don't particularly see any need to deliberate or pre have a presentation. I don't know if anybody else feels the same way. Okay. I Other appreciate the numbers. The um, dates being provided in the um, in the narrative. <clears throat> Other comments from counselors? Just to put a finer point on that, it's 24 years of experience. So yeah. uh, this person is well, well qualified. Over qualified. All right. <clears throat> I'll offer one more time. Any other comments from council? All right, seeing none. I think Councilor Hawk. Councilor Hawk. Yes, I was very impressed with the resume. I think that we're fortunate to have this person join us here in Monroe County Government. Um, I was very curious to see if when the start, I, I can see the effective date is to be at May 8th, but I was curious to see if this person has already started. Not that it matters. I'm going to say yes, so it doesn't matter. But, but just as a reminder, they're not supposed to go ahead and hire and then come and ask for the right. change. Just as a reminder. If the council would like, I can try to make contact with Ms. Oliphant to see if um, she is going to appear tonight in regards to this um, the motion. 
I, I think council doesn't necessarily need her to appear right now, but we could always follow up on that question as well. Any other comments from council? All right, seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call, a public comment. Public comment. I think you can do a voice vote on this one. No hands raised. No hands raised. All right. So seeing no public comment, I'll ask for a voice vote on this motion. All those counselors in favor of this signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All right. The motion is passed. I'm going to move on now to. If we can revisit that, I think it has to be a roll call vote since it has that appropriation and salary amendment. Uh, All right. Do we have a motion to redo that vote? You don't need to redo. Just if, if you want to roll, if anybody wants a roll call vote, you can just call for. You can just do a roll call vote. Okay. Any counselors calling for a roll call vote? Go ahead. I call. Okay. Just Let's do a roll call vote on item number six. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. All right. Thank you very much. We'll move on now to item number seven. This is a council request from Councillor Iverson with a resolution 2022-17. Councillor Iverson. Council, I move to approve resolution 2022-17, a resolution supporting the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Councillor Iverson, uh, would you like to speak on the item? Well, uh, yes, uh, President Pro Tem Deckard, I certainly would. I'm very happy to be able to bring this before council. And we do have uh, members of the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition with us here tonight. I also see that Jackie Yenna is joining us on Zoom. Um, and of course, he plays a, a very strong leadership role here in Monroe County. Before I begin with comments, um, I do want to ask for an amendment to this resolution. Um, it has been pointed out to me that the uh, correct title is the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition uh, dash uh, United Electrical Workers. Uh, so if uh, so, I would move that where in the resolution it says Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition, it be replaced with Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition dash United Electrical Workers. So there's I'll second that. Motion and a second to amend that. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, let's do a voice vote on that. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. What, what are we doing? Are, they, are you voting on it right now? He has amended the name. Of, oh, changing the name. Yeah, there's some language the that was wrong. No. So that passed. All right. So I wanted to speak a little bit on this resolution, and then I think it would be appropriate to hear just a little bit from our guests tonight. Uh, the resolution talks about how important students are uh, at Indiana University to the education and research mission of our community, that uh, they're currently making efforts to receive that recognition as a union and the right to collectively bargain for increased benefits and job security. We also note um, in this resolution that Monroe County regularly engages in constructive collective bargaining with a number of local organizations to ensure fair working standards and Monroe County adopted a responsible bidder ordinance, which ensures worker safety when using contractors back in October, 2010. And so this resolution says that we, uh, Monroe County, while we continually seek to ensure the fairest possible worker safety and compensation standards in the community, we support the efforts taken by the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition to achieve that same fairness. Um, and I think, um, I think that's where I'll end my comments. And if I could have the council's discretion to um, seek comment from our guests tonight. 
Yeah. Without objection. Yeah, we will now open this up into some public comment and then I'll open it back up to counselors comments. So if you are here to speak on this resolution, I'll invite you to come to this uh, table here that we have. Um, join us, feel free to tell us your name and uh, offer any comments and TSD, I'm gonna ask that we do about three minutes per, no more than three minutes per speaker if you could keep time for us. And there's a sign-in sheet there, just so your name is there for the record. Yeah. Welcome to the Monroe County Council. And Thank thanks you. for sitting through uh, my laboring of doing this job uh, for the first time. Hopefully it's been a <laughs> decent experience for you. It's, been, it's been wonderful. Um, so my name is Nora Weber. I will fill this in in a moment. Uh, and I am a fourth year PhD candidate at IU uh, in the sociology department. Uh, I teach a graduate level statistics course I'm also the assistant director of the IU Sociology Lab, uh, which engages with a group of undergraduate research assistants um, and graduate students to provide an opportunity to do uh, experimental sociology research, which is, it's, we're not doing any like wild experiment. It's, it's doing uh, uh, types of surveys that have uh, experimental components to them. Um, and so this research is really critical to IU. It's the, the work that we do in the classroom, the work we do engaging with undergraduates provides them with a really quality experience at IU. It prepares them uh, to go on to graduate education themselves. It prepares them to go on to uh, seek different types of employment. And I love teaching. I love you know what I do in the classroom. I think everybody here who is in the classroom loves what they do um, and is passionate about it. And we wanna make sure that the students have the best possible experience they can. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not possible to have that type of engagement that we want to have when most graduate workers on campus are working at least one or two or more side jobs. Um, this is certainly, again, my, the assistant director role is, is my second job on campus. Uh, I also do at least one other side job at any given time. Um, and yeah, so what uh, the, the Grad Workers Coalition has been fighting for is, is for improvement in our wages, in protections for international graduate workers, improvements in our benefits, things that as we've seen tuition go up at IU, as we've seen the cost of living in Bloomington continue to go up, as we've seen the university talk about its record-breaking enrollments and its record-breaking endowment, uh, we're not seeing any of that money. And we believe as the educators in the classroom, we should be seeing uh, we should be seeing that and we should have an opportunity to negotiate when we feel that we're not being compensated fairly. Uh, so uh, yeah, we are really, really grateful to have the endorsement of other members of the community, including the Bloomington City Council um, just last week. And again, it, we are all residents of, of Bloomington. We're residents of Monroe County. And we know that it's better for, and you all know certainly, that it's better for the county, for the state and for the city uh, when you have people who are being paid fairly uh, and compensated in a way that we can engage with the community the way that we would like to, as well as engage in the classroom in the way that we would like to. Uh, so thank you so much for having us this evening. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, would you like to make some comments? Can I just? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sabina Ali. I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Religious Studies. and. I'm just really here to represent graduate workers um, who teach about a thousand classes at IU. Um, as Nora said, we're a vital and irreplaceable part of undergraduate education. And we really love our students. We're dedicated to our work in the classroom. Um, as Nora mentioned as well, um, we must manage the anxieties of living way below the poverty line, being um, you know, barely able to pay rent, to buy groceries, to pay bills, to pay for other necessities. Um, there are many, many testimonials from graduate workers that I'm just kind of summarizing here that are, um, you know, really tragic. <laughs> um, in addition to the full-time work that we already do, many of us have to take on additional jobs to support ourselves. And this, of course, impacts our ability to fully show up in the classroom in the ways that we need to, in the ways that help our students. Um, I used to be a public school teacher 
did you mention that you were a teacher? <laughs> I teach at IU as well. Okay, yes. So, you know, our struggles as teachers everywhere, public school teachers, and otherwise, you know, they're connected. We want more money to go into the classroom, um, into education, and not into the pockets of a few administrators at the top. How can we justify giving an administrator a $500,000 bonus? By the way, it was uh, former IU President McCrabby um, who got that bonus, uh, while graduate workers barely make ends meet. Um, despite our struggles, we're great and dedicated teachers. Uh, we know that we need union recognition to bargain for a living wage and better working conditions because working people have collective power in a union. Nothing else, no task force or committee or listening session has worked so far. And a union will, and we will really, really appreciate your endorsement. Um, and support in our struggle for union recognition. Thank you for listening. Yes, my name is uh, Despina Panagetidou. I am uh, a graduate worker at the Jacobs School of Music, and I wanted to talk briefly as also an international graduate worker at IEU. In addition to $1,000 like mandatory fees uh, annually, international students are required to pay $700 in international student fees. And even though IU takes pride of being a leader in international student education and a school that promotes equity and inclusion, this uh, 700 uh, international fees, one of the highest uh, fees across the big 10 schools. Considering that international students are not uh, allowed to take extra jobs outside uh, their contract with the university, this brings us into a precarious position in comparison to our American peers. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the situation at the Jacobs School of Music, the so-called like crown of Indiana University. Um, an international graduate student majoring in music theory as myself has a stipend of $10,400, which is then reduced by almost half once the mandatory fees, the international fee, and a $2,165 Jacobs annual fee. Um, that's because, uh, and the remaining 5,300 gives us just over $500 per month before taxes, which, with which we have to pay rent, buy food, and generally support ourselves. I, this semester, I teach 120 students, I actually supervise five other peers like as associate instructors and I have to support myself with this amount. Um, these stipends are being objectively low, especially from a well-known conservatory such as Jacobs School. And this situation impacts the recruitment, retention, but also uh, has a mental health toll to the current graduate student workers. And yes, these are some of the reasons why uh, we are asking the IU administration to recognize the precarious, uh, our precarious working conditions and to recognize our union. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Charles Alt. Thank you guys for letting me come talk to you today. I'm a third year uh, graduate student in the chemistry department. Uh, I kind of consider myself to be uh, luckier than a lot of my peers. I get about $26,000 a year, which is about $10,000 more than some of my my peers make. And it wasn't until I started getting involved in this effort that I realized how stark the difference can be. I've been fortunate in that my time at IU, I've been able to make ends meet pretty consistently. I've not had to take out a second job. I'm able to spend, you know, the 20 or 30 hours doing research on top of my 20 or so hours teaching every week. Um, but I've also seen that our wages have been pretty stagnant across time. Uh, I know that at the rate things are going, we've gotten one 5% raise in the last decade. Uh, at the rate that is, I know that a farm kid like me from Illinois is not going to be able to come and get a graduate education without getting crippling amounts of debt um, or having to work extra jobs which is going to affect the quality of research I can do. You know, I think graduate education is something that should be accessible to everybody based on their merits, um, based on their ability to work hard, not based on their ability to have access to independent wealth. Um, I know that these issues we've got, um, these crazy low stipends you just heard about in Jacob School of Music and and they're low elsewhere too. $18,000 is pretty standard. And I can't imagine living in this town on that kind of money, even, even as a student, you know. Um, and then it's been known for a long time that those are issues. They had a commission study, uh, commission 
um, of the university that decided back in 2019 that these were issues, they're, they're well known and our demands are, are pretty simple when we're looking at unionization, but the university has shown that they'd like to only give us the least they can. Uh, as to why they want to do that, I'm not sure, but I don't think it serves the interests of the community. I think that IU being good, being able to attract high quality students is important and I use uh, lag behind a lot of its peer institutions. So I believe honestly that this union is going to be something that's going to be good. Of course, for us, you know, I don't think that people who make better pay like me are going to see huge increases, but it's going to make life livable for my peers here. Who I really care about. It's also going to help continue to attract high quality graduate students to Indiana University, which is going to have a lot of benefits and people that stay in the community because we volunteer here. We live here. We work here. We pay taxes here. We shop at the stores here. So I think that anything that ultimately is good for helping lift us up, helps to elevate the community, helps to lift us all uh, to benefit the quality of research that's performed. And uh, I think that it was the union will be able to bargain for what we, we ought to be getting a fair shake rather than having to beg for the scraps that uh, administration at IU lets us have. And uh, thank you all for listening to me. Hi, uh, so my name is John Brandt. Uh, I'm a graduate uh, doctoral candidate in the School of Public Health here at IU. And I'll try not to be too redundant. My colleagues have gone over a lot of the really important issues that I feel like are just, they deserve repeating, but I'll try not to waste your time with um, extra repeating. Um, something that I wanna highlight that the union can bring about that I think is really important is uh, in academic work, as well as in many aspects of life, mentorship is key. Uh, one thing that the union can do is to provide a stronger basis for mentorship between someone that's advising a doctoral student or a graduate student and uh, the person that's actually receiving the study and the mentorship. The administration moving dollars and funding away from graduate education also defunds undergraduate education, which you've heard because it stretches us a little bit too thin. We uh, can't perform in the classroom as well, but it also strains the relationships that we have with our advisors. When monies aren't being diverted into departments to help support graduate education, we end up working these extra jobs, uh, which then means that we're probably not performing to the best we can in research or instruction. But it also means that if they're not funding our education and our work as well, they're probably also diverting funding away from our principal investigators, our research advisors, our departmental advisors, uh, which I've seen firsthand. It causes those advisors to then put extra tasks on the graduate workers, even though they don't necessarily want to. This creates a very imbalanced kind of relationship where we're required to do work that fulfills both our actual requirements that we're hired to do, as well as work that is intended to kind of help push our advisors' agendas along. And we feel very compelled to do it and create this lot of friction. In a good and ideal environment, advisors try to protect their students as best they can. A union can help protect us even more by allowing for funding to be diverted to keep them from putting extra work on top of us in the research constructing realm. Further, it allows for a grievance procedure, uh, which the union has been, we've been very open about having to work uh, towards a better relationship in general, but there are power dynamics at play. And often if you're a bad advisor or if you have kind of malicious intent, you can kind of coerce your doctoral students, your graduate workers, your master's students to either do work that you know is bad for them or even put them in a situation that's damaging. We believe that diverting funding through a lot of these other sources and supporting graduate education and graduate workers is something that the union can advocate for. And in doing so, protects its graduate workers, its graduate students, while also providing a better, stronger research base, better student body in the undergraduate level, as well as the graduate level, and also protects graduate workers so that they don't then in turn turn around and end up knowing only the pain that they've had as a graduate worker at the hands of an advisor who is malicious. So just a couple of things that I felt were very important, especially that I wanted to bring up. Uh, and I hope that that gives you a little bit more of a picture of some more of the issues that we're trying to help the union will solve. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to make sure, uh, TSD, if we have any public comments from those joining us via Zoom. We do not. Okay. I'll invite now for council comments and or questions. And I'll start uh, to my left. I do have comments. And first of all, I want to thank um, all five of you for, for coming to speak tonight. Um, I think it's important for us to hear from you. And I think it's important for the general public who pays attention to Indiana University and what goes on there to also hear from you. Let's see, 57 years ago, I was a graduate student and I remember the term starving graduate student. Um, 
things haven't really changed very much in 57 years. No, I was at, I was at a neighboring institution in an adjacent Big Ten <laughs> University, but it's not all that different. Um, I guess I've been surprised to read about um, what has what is going on now at Indiana University and what I know from um, graduate students in, in my field. I just want to say that I heartily support this resolution and I hope for a better outcome for the graduate students, for the undergraduates who benefit from your teaching and your research, and uh, and for the faculty who work closely with you and who are also strongly supporting you. Thank you. Councilor Carson. Yeah, I would just, <clears throat> excuse me, um, again, just thanking y'all for showing up and just shout out to y'all for actually like standing up for yourself and using your voice. Um, you know, that's, that's something that's definitely near and dear for me and is very important. And a couple of weeks ago, I was actually fortunate to stand in solidarity with some of the graduate students on a Friday, um, and I continue to do so, which, um, and it also brings into consideration that, you know, it's, you're not asking for much, you're just asking for simple things, and it's basic fundamental ways of having a livable wage so that you can afford to live in a high cost um, town, which is that's a whole nother subject and we won't go into that because we'll be here all night. Um, <laughs> but again, it's just asking for basic things. Um, and I just appreciate you all just, you know, not backing down and continuing your efforts. And if there is anything that I can do to continue to help um, and support you all in your endeavors, I definitely will. And I wholeheartedly um, support this and you have my support. Thank you. Comments from the right, Councilman. Well, I think I've, I've said a lot already, so I don't know I'm gonna say too much more, but I do wanna make two points here. I certainly appreciated the argument that graduate uh, students uh, pay taxes. And that's certainly one of the roles that we play here is that we help appropriate tax dollars to important programs. And you know, it's, it's not lost, I think, on us that you are providing multiple services even beyond the classroom. So thank you for that. I also wanted to thank our legal department for helping draft this resolution. Um, you, you've made it very easy to find information about uh, your movement and uh, everything. So I'm very happy that tonight we could bring you here in solidarity. Um, first of all, I want to welcome you to your Monroe County Courthouse. This doesn't belong to us, it belongs to the people of this county and uh, the students and uh, the uh, graduate students, matter of, of what age or what they do when they go to the university, they are a very important part of this community, of this entire county, because the students don't all live downtown Wilmington. We have them throughout the county, uh, and so uh, you're an important part of this county. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you came to share your concerns uh, through the ability to reach out to the public. One thing I wanted to make clear, and I think it, it can get very confusing, the city council is the fiscal body and the legislative body of the city. The county council is not the same. The county commissioners are the legislative body. The county council is only the fiscal body. We are supposed to be looking at budgets, appropriations, and discussing tax rates and all of those things, which we seem to kind of that gets lost in the weeds. So I won't be voting on this, either yes or no, because it's not, in my opinion, our place for it to be here, except to hear you and to allow the public to hear your concerns. But I hope you'll understand that's not our role. And uh, when you look at the legislation that sets up how county councils are supposed to work, we're supposed to be laser focused on those budgets so that we can make the good decisions. So I appreciate you being here 
and uh, and I, I wish you the very best. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hawk. Offer some final comments. I also thank you for coming here, setting through our agenda, making some time to talk to us and to talk about what is deeply important, not only to you, but to the constituents that you represent that are out there that we've heard and we've, we've seen. Uh, the comments I'll offer is, is the following, is that I think that there's something going on, not only in this country, but others, where people are looking hard at the way they spend their time and the way that things are um, rewarded and given to them based on how they devote their time. And anybody that knows anything about teachers, researchers, et cetera, knows that you do give your time and your passion. Um, you either love that stuff or it doesn't work out real well. And I know you all are at a place in your career where you have figured that out. I think that every organization, including Indiana University, our county, everyone, has to listen and when there is a tender spot in which people are saying, I don't like this. I don't like how this is going and I want you to listen to me. I think every organization, whoever it is, has to stop and to say, I need to listen here and I gotta figure it out. And I'll figure it out is a tough thing. And I am not the kind of person that can tell anyone exactly how to figure that out. But I think this resolution starts with recognition of some of that. And I'll also offer this, and I know it's just, it's just coming from uh, county council down the lane, but I think it is a tender spot. I'll also say this, I am the son uh, of an electrical worker. Uh, I used to be in Kroger management and I was on the opposite side of some of those things. But when a steward came in, you listened and you recognize that management can sometimes make erroneous decisions. And that is why you have the union. I think we have to be mindful at all times that not all the time this is a fun, loving, peaceful process, but it's an organization method by which advocacy happens. And look, it is what it is. So I would just offer my support of the resolution in that vein. Uh, and the, the last thing I will say, I embarrass my mother every time I say this, but I remember a time when as the son of a county employee, vision care was not fully offered to our county employees. And I would watch my mother get into her pocketbook and get cash out to pay the optometrist so that I could have the glasses, the contacts I needed. I'm pleased to see this county, including members of this council have changed all that. Yeah. Things change over time. People get things right, people get things better. So wherever we're at, whatever position down the lane or otherwise, look at the tender spot Let's figure it out. So with that, any further council comments? Seeing none, I will ask for a roll call vote on the motion. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Pass. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Deckard. Yes. Motion passed majority five to zero to one. Thank you very much. We will thank you, by the way, for coming to our meeting. You're welcome to stay and you're also welcome to not stay. That's on you. We, thank you. We care why the jail has problems. Thank you. We're now, we'll now move to item number eight. I'm delighted to say it's the Monroe County Public Library. Everybody gets happy in the library, always comes, right? And I'd like to invite Marilyn Wood and Greer Carson from the library to give us a brief update. Welcome to council, welcome to your courthouse. Well, thank you for having us tonight. So I'm Marilyn Wood, as you know, and Greer Carson is our new director of Monroe County Public Library as of May 7th. Good evening, thank you for having us. So thank you for having us here tonight. And I want to share with you a little bit about some of our 2021 achievements and also talk a bit about our future. So some of those exciting things that are about to happen. The last time that we spoke was June, 2021. So not quite a year ago. And of course we, like everyone, uh, were in the middle of the pandemic, but we were also planning for our future. 
And throughout the pandemic, I just want to uh, just say how proud I have been of the library and the way that it's met the needs of the community. There were so many times that we pivoted in terms of the services that were provided, the way we thought about providing services, the way we reached out to the community to find out what their needs were, and just incorporated changes on a daily basis, as so many of us did. But I'm so proud that we were able to do that because it was such an important asset to the community at that time. And we've heard that frequently from people. And now they're beginning to come back uh, more and more often. And that's that too is very satisfying to see as, as particularly as kids are coming back um, into the uh, children's space across the system. But we did adapt with new technology. We communicated with the community in different ways. We increased access to electronic resources. We issued library cards remotely. We created virtual programs and any number of other things that maybe even one of you uh, participated in using library services. So there were many achievements and I shared with each of you the list of achievements for 2021. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them as we talk tonight. And some of them actually you will hear maybe uh, hear a little bit more about as you hear uh, from the jail this evening and perhaps the parks and rec late, uh, later. Um, but we had an ongoing uh, partnership with the jail that's been going on for many years and we provide programming and bring books to those who are incarcerated. Uh, we work with parks department and we have a story walk at Flatwoods Park, uh, probably about five years now, time does fly. Uh, we have a little free library at Will Detmer Park and we work together to bring environmental education resources and programs to the community. You're all aware of CATS and Community Access Television and they in 2021 covered 665 government meetings. Uh, some, many of them were remotely, uh, so they were hybrid meetings in some cases, but they also were in person. And, and, and in 2020 and 21, uh, we spent a great deal of time in updating our, our infrastructure to ensure that we could provide access uh, in, for these democratic processes into the future. And we're working really hard to ensure that that continues in whatever technology or ways we need to be there. Um, also to ensure that library services really meet our community needs. Uh, we were out on our bookmobile with 20, I think we're up to 29 stops a week at this time. I don't know what we say. Um, and it's in all corners of the community. And, and that continued throughout uh, 2021. We also introduced new uh, self-paced e-library resources, those to teach skills that are needed to communicate using computers, as we all did. We also continued to uh, deliver books to Head Start, to uh, our service uh, that we now call um, house calls. Used, I'm not even, I can't even remember what it used to be. Now it's called house calls. Uh, also to senior living, living communities, um, as well as that, you know, the um, bookmobile. So those are just a few of the programs and services that positively impacted the community in 2021. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions in a moment about any of this. But uh, today I'm also very pleased to share with you, hot off the press, uh, this is our latest program guide. Uh, this will be for programs from May to July. And it's, it's so exciting to bring these beloved programs back and in person uh, in 2022 and really to bring the community together. This is the first one we've had since 2020. So, but meeting our strategic needs uh, to provide library services includes expanding. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that new branch. As the council's well aware, we were planning for the new branch or have been planning for a new branch for many, many years. And we were deep into it in 2020 and did continue into 2021 uh, where we worked on the final designs of the building. Uh, we secured funding and a lot of under the, uh, what would call behind the scenes, I would call them activities. We were also very fortunate to receive a pledge from our foundation, our Friends of the Library group uh, for $650,000, which will go a very long way in, in putting equipment and furniture in our new branch. 
And finally, in September of 2021, we hired Strasser Construction Company and a local company uh, that we have worked with in the past. And we're very pleased that they began work in October of 2021. So, and just to remind you all as conversations that we've had in the past, our financial goals uh, during this project were also always uh, that we would be able to add a new branch while maintaining the other two branches that we have and ensuring that we would have exceptional stewardship of those facilities and resources going forward, as well as creating a new branch while we maintain our current tax rate which we are. So ultimately we will end up with three branches, all of them with their own identity and their own characteristics and their own ways of providing services to the community in which they, they live. So today our new branch is becoming very visible. Um, foundations are in place, the ground floor walls are almost all in place and site development is underway. Uh, you can actually view it on a time-lapse video on our branch website. And so you can see it up to the moment. It's very cool to watch. Our new building is located at 890 West Gordon Pike, where we are gonna serve a very densely populated area and we are adjacent to Bachelor Middle School. It's a 21,000 square foot building. And by way of comparison, downtown is 135,000 square feet and Ellisville is 15,5. The building will face Gordon Pike. There will be parking both on uh, the surface lot and also to reduce the amount of surface that we uh, are uh, have with asphalt, we're putting parking underneath the building. So we will have about a hundred spots, plenty uh, to accommodate the people in the building. The east wall uh, that will uh, be on the building is, is very tall and very beautiful. Uh, it, it enjoys the beauty of the surroundings. This is uh, a building that is going to be, I would call it, that's our destination. Uh, it is snuggled in those trees and surrounded by the beauty of the community. It's warm and very open. Uh, there will also be an amphitheater. So this is our first foray into outdoor activities. Uh, we don't have space downtown nor at Ellisville. And so now we have a little extra space. We will have an amphitheater where we hope that the community will, will bring music or performance or other ways just to, to gather together. And we're looking very much forward to that. We also hope that there are opportunities for us to partner with other organizations for some um, wellness trails and uh, the, to connect to bachelor middle school. We feel pretty certain that the bachelor students will make their own path to us. Um, we, we, we would like to help guide them do that in a way that's on a path that we can, that we can also include uh, with some learning benefits as well. So we're very ex excited about having this outdoor space. When you come in the building, you can come, either, you, you can come in through the south side or uh, from the ground floor and up a, a staircase where there will be little nooks where people can sit and look out um, of the building or have a, a quiet place to study. Uh, in the atrium, there's a service area where we will have displays, access to circulating collections of popular materials, public computers, business machines. We'll have special spaces to welcome our children. As you know, we are very, uh, our spaces are really well used, I guess I would say, both at downtown and at Ellisville. They're loved by our kids and parents alike, and we will model those spaces at the new Southwest branch as well. And also building on the successes downtown and in Ellisville in our teen space, we're building a very similar one at the Southwest branch. Our expectations are that this is gonna be a pretty energetic and, and well-used space uh, at about 3 p.m. each day. Uh, and we're looking forward to that. We have gaming spaces, meeting rooms where we find that the teens use that for class prep. Uh, there's a lot of analog game playing that goes on. Uh, hangout spaces, DIY of all sorts, uh, and really an opportunity for these teens to learn lifelong skills, which we find happens just about every day. So our new uh, branch will also offer some unique spaces. We have a teaching kitchen, and it's a space that a lot of our partner organizations are very interested in working, us, working with us. 
Um, it's an innovative space for free hands-on health and wellness learning. It'll be open to Monroe County residents of all ages. Uh, it really is a learning lab um, in which we anticipate there will be nutrition education in partnership with a variety of, of organizations. It's less traditional to the library. Uh, perhaps it's not unknown in other libraries, uh, but we expect that we will have cooking classes, which were regularly requested by the community during our, our surveys. And uh, it wasn't, a, it was a request that was not only made by adults, but also by the bachelor middle school students. When we surveyed them, um, there were 371 teens surveyed and they selected cooking classes as their second most desired library feature, just wow. behind gaming. Wow. <laughs> So cooking, if you think about it, has so many basic literacy skills everywhere from reading a recipe to learning how to do measurements to, to uh, learning how to use the, the tools, um, studying the science of cooking, growing foods, understanding the connection between health and food, exploring cultures, coming together, community. We're really looking forward to this. So the equipment in this teaching kitchen is made possible with grant funding. We uh, received about $42,000 from the Community Foundation. We will also have another unique space and this one we're calling a collaborative learning space. Um, it will have different sorts of technology, 3D printers, uh, et cetera. And it, it too will be a space for collaborative learning. Uh, we expect programming uh, to happen in there as well, but we also expect that it's gonna be a space that might be a niche for uh, individuals who aren't served in other areas of the library, perhaps teens, perhaps senior citizens, perhaps others, depending upon the time of day, it could be any one of those. So we are going to learn how that's used and just model what we need to do as we find, um, as we follow the patterns of use. So today uh, we are in week 26 of a 15 month construction project, the weather and some unanticipated rock excavation set us back a few weeks. We're in the southwest part of the county, uh, but we have been very fortunate so far uh, with supply chains and we are ordering everything well in advance. So we hope that will mitigate any of the additional delays. Yeah, so our construction is scheduled to be complete, complete in late March of 2023. And then following that, we have about two months um, of time that we will be spending setting the space up, adding books and really preparing to open. So if all goes well, we should be open by May of 2023. Great. Overall, uh, the overall cost of constructing this building, the land is about $11 million. And it takes an additional two and a half million to design the space, furnish it, add shelving, add books, technology. And so our total project cost is $13.7 million. And it will be funded or it is being funded through a $6 million construction bond, which will pay back over 20 years. And the remaining 7 million plus is savings that the library accumulated specifically for this project. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Are you looking we're, at the time? We're, we're sitting there watching the time lapse. Right now. <laughs> 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 of course. Yeah. Uh, That's very cool. I was hoping someone starts, would do that. It starts in the snow and I'm uh -huh. everything. Yep. Uh, you yep. can't introduce toys like that, a place like this, and not have us play with them. That's, <laughs> totally no this is this is fantastic questions comments from council councillor hawk uh, yes uh welcome so good to see you again you. um as you know i'm a huge supporter mm -hmm. of the library um, and excited about how it's coming along um, and also was interested uh, when we had the friends of the library over in ellettsville mm -hmm. and that I think that was before COVID hit. It was, yes. So that's been a while, but yeah. a lot of interesting, fine people there. But I wanted to say, I am excited about what's happening at the Ellsville Library on the 16th, okay, between Drew. six and seven. This coming uh, on Monday, May 16th budgeting basics smart money habits so yes i i'm i'm all about the money because you know what 
I spent so many years working with folks trying to get into housing and they really did not understand how to put together a budget. And back in those days, you had to turn in a, a formal budget into the office that was the rural housing and it used to be called Farmer's Home. And if they couldn't make that budget work, I'd say, do you get, do you have a Coke or something during your lunch hour? Well, okay. maybe you have to get, they didn't realize how each of those things could add up to a lot right. at the end of the 30 days to make their budget work out. Right. Many of them had to give up cigarettes and all kinds of things that they were doing that kept them from getting into their home. Mm -hmm. These budgeting basics for people who really need to understand how to make their dollars work and how great that you're doing that at the library. And that's for ages 18 and up. And it's uh, on the 16th of May from six to seven. I hope you have a great turnout. Thank you. I hope we do too. One of the things that we learned during the, the strategic planning process as we talked to, to many of the organizations around town was the need for some of those basic things for teens as well, how to, how to prepare for an interview, how to pack a lunch how to understand some of those basic things about what it means to have a job, um, as well as more on the you know, very hands-on tactical skills. Um, so we, we are trying very hard to, to, as we call them, those lifelong skills to, to help uh, people of all ages. Awesome. Other questions or comments? Councilor McKinnon. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, terrific uh, comprehensive presentation. Thank you. Um, what, how are the actual costs in construction holding up versus projected? Well, interesting that you would ask. Um, <laughs> so we, I guess what I, uh, when we started this process, having gone through two pretty um, recent renovations, I thought, wow, we've got it made. This is new construction. There shouldn't be any problems. We're gonna be able to start uh, with what we want, how much it costs and go from there. Only thing is, you know, it, and like in renovation, it's behind the wall, what you don't know is there. Well, in this case, it was what was underground that we didn't know. So our biggest, um, our, our biggest change has been excavation of rock. We hit a lot and it was in the Southwest corner of that building. And so it changed our, our cost about $300,000. So we were very fortunate though, that we have been planning for this and knew that there was, there was going to be a need to have some latitude. So uh, we are, we're covering that with some of the surplus funds that we have from this year. In fact, over, over the, beyond that, I would say things are going really, really well. And that our allotments um, and the, what we have put in place um, is, is fine and it's gonna cover it. And we're trying to get all of those orders out fast before any else, anything else changes. Well, I'm glad you had a management reserve built in there. That sounds like uh, that was adequate to the task. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So. Other comments? So finding rock in Monroe County, imagine that. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's a story it of construction mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed my time working with uh, the library and staff um, on community interest in uh, what sort of facility to build. Mm -hmm. And I so much appreciate how the library reached out uh, throughout the county to, uh, to see what kind of facility this should become. And I know people are excited about this and I just want to encourage, I want to encourage Greer <laughs> to, uh, to give regular updates to the community on, you know, what's, what's ahead, uh, how things are progressing because people are so excited about this <clears throat> and they do want to know how things are going. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? I'm just excited that something like this is coming to the South Side, being the South Side resident and also having a team. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to be sending them yes. to um, <laughs> cooking class because she could definitely benefit Excellent. from it. So I'm, I'm really excited because this is also a walking distance and I know a lot of folks on the South Side would be able to get to this. So yay. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll just jump in and add that this is awesome. 
I'm so happy to get anything on the library. And a lot of that is based on in my life, spending a lot of time at the library and now with my daughters. And it blows my mind how much you all do. This is a smart library and it, you, you've all got a great heart for it. But I mean, even looking at this document, it has blown me away the ways the library is touching lives in the community. Last night I was driving across town. I've got the bookmobile behind me. And the irony was I was thinking, my gosh, how long have I been seeing a bookmobile in <laughs> right. this community? And it's been my entire life. Since 1929. Think about that. 1929. <laughs> Think about community access television. We are literally reaching people who both know us, like us, sometimes don't like us, based on the fact that they can watch us participate. Now they're coming in on via Zoom. And tech service has been great about that. And now we have the Southside Library. And it just, it's a wondrous thing. I remember sometime, one time somebody was talking about, you know, the concept of, uh, of uh, shared workspace. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, it sounds a lot like a library. You've mm -hmm. got internet, you've got access, resource, et cetera. And now you've got cooking. And who would have thought about that? But the fact is you surveyed and that's just smart. That's smart stuff. So I know that so much of that is your leadership director. And I'm, I'm so happy for you as you enter this transition that you're doing. And I think we're going to be looking at the hard work of you and your predecessors in these projects for some time to come. And we're also excited that you've got the wise leadership to bring your, your, your replace. I don't like that word, but your other leader, you're bringing him on and he's here and he's been around. Gosh, I see you guys all the time going to places and that's smart. And um, we're just grateful to you. So thank, thank you very so much. much. Thank you. Councilor Iverson. Oh, did you want to go first, Councilor? Oh, I, I just wanted to say, this is one of the most important things you'll be wallet. carrying in your wallet. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't cost anything to, to get this. And it brings you a lifetime of enjoyment. So I'm proud. We're going to video that. <laughs> Councilor Iverson. Thank you all for being here and presenting such a wonderful presentation. I, I cannot even start to replicate what my colleagues have said, uh, except to say that I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, and it feels like we practically live at the library. So thank you for everything you do. I want to pull out two things from this fantastic report that mm -hmm. you, you gave tonight. And on page two, you talk about the Mineral County Childhood Conditions Summit. Mm -hmm. And we just, that is such a great event. It happens every year. And just the collaboration that you all uh, engage with the county and other partners, uh, th that's mm -hmm. just so important. And it really speaks to, you know, how wonderful our community is. And the second thing I want to point out is the, uh, uh, the section on accessibility and inclusivity. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's really, really important. And a lot of times you can't tell. You know, there are multiple members of my family that are navigating life with dyslexia. And going to a library is not necessarily their favorite place. But guess what? The Monroe County Public Library is a welcoming place. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for focusing on that. Because I don't know that you always hear from folks to say you made a difference and I want to be at the library, but it's happening. So thank, thank you, you very much for sharing that. Thank you. All right. Well, I think there's no other questions or comments. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and thank you for having us. Thank you. We're excited for days ahead. Thank you. That'll take us on our agenda to item number nine. And it is a report from the Correctional Center and Colonel Crow, I believe is here. We welcome him back to County Council. Welcome, Colonel Crow. <laughs> Good evening, Council members. Molly, it's nice to see you here. <laughs> it, that's going to be hard to compete with. I mean, I, I might as well just turn around and go home. Um, as a child in Monroe County, I spent a lot of time at the downtown library with programs. So that's a great, it's a great thing. Awesome. And they still work a lot with us at the jail. And I'll get into some of that. And I think we have a PowerPoint. Awesome. TSD, do you want to bring up Colonel's PowerPoint? Thank you. So we can go ahead and go there. Uh, that's not it. 
That's jail inspection. Good, I didn't miss anything. There we go. There we go. So the annual jail report, Indiana code states that any jail in the state of Indiana has to prepare and submit a annual report uh, by March 31st of the next year. Um, so we try to put a lot of information into this annual report um, and probably put more information in there than what is really required by statute. Um, and I think that's necessary for us to show what's going on in the jail. Uh, so this is just a little bit of a, a review of what we've done in the past year. A little history about the jail. The, the building process was started in 1984. Uh, it was completed in 1986. That's when the inmates moved in. At that time, there were 128 beds. Over the years, there have been many remodeling projects. Uh, basically, we have filled every nook and cranny that we could with a bed. And today, our bed count is at 294. So um, not quite tripling the space, the initial space. And all this has been done with the same footprint that we had in 1984, 1986. Uh, you know, there's no room to expand. There's no room to go up. Um, so we're using what resources we had and what footprint we had. Um, in that bed space, there are two cells for uh, ADA compliance. We also have two cells that are negative pressure. Um, and we use those cells quite a bit. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, this gives a description of the cell blocks and the amount of beds that are in each cell block. And it comes up with a total of 294 beds. Uh, and this includes our segregation cells, our padded cells, holding cells, and then all the cell blocks in the program areas. Next slide, please. Uh, booking statistics. The dynamics of the jail have changed in the past two years with COVID. Just as everything else in the country has changed, the jail has changed. Um, the type of people that are getting arrested, the type of people that are staying in the jail um, has changed a lot. In the 90s, when I started in the jail, we referred to one side of the jail, the east side as the misdemeanor side, and the west side was the felony side. And at that time, we had a pretty equal number of misdemeanor and felon arrests. Today, it's not that way. We may have 5%, 10% of our total population as misdemeanor arrests. The rest of them are going to be more serious type arrests, felony arrests. Um, so that dynamic has changed a lot. The, uh, the type of people that we house in the jail that stay in the jail for any amount of time has really changed. Um, and that not only affects staffing, that affects our programs, that affects uh, basically everything we do in the jail. Um, if you wanna look at the top 10 bookings, uh, number one is failure to appear. So they've had a court date, they failed to show up for that court date, so a warrant was issued for that person. They were rearrested, brought back to jail. Hold for another jurisdiction. This is a hold for another county, another state. Probation violation, they've been convicted of a crime. They got out on probation. They did something to violate the terms of probation. They got it rearrested and brought back to jail. So with those first three, especially one and three, we have a recidivism problem. Um, and you can also see that with number six and number seven, probation holds and violations of terms of placement. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people that come back to jail that have been arrested before, you know, over and over and over. Uh, and it's really sad because in my time at the jail, I am starting to see the third generation of the same family. So it's not just one person coming back over and over again, it's becoming a family trait. Uh, and that's, that's kind of difficult to see. Um, then the other arrests and arrests that are 
kind of topping that list, resisting law enforcement and operating while intoxicated, uh, domestic battery, and then battery or aggravated battery. And then the last one, number 10, is theft. Um, so those are kind of common charges that we see quite a bit of. Um, but the key thing with this is the recidivism rate. Yeah. Um, you can see the admissions uh, during 2020 and 2021, those numbers went down. 2021, they went down pretty drastically. And again, I think part of that is due to COVID. Uh, a lot of the arresting agencies are citing people into jail more rather than making the arrest. Um, so we're grateful to those agencies. Um, and that helps us out quite a bit. Next slide, please. Uh, this is average inmate population. And we went back 10 years. Uh, so you can see that 2021 was the lowest average inmate population we've had during those 10 years. There's a number of things that have contributed to that. Um, the judges are doing extremely well at keeping people out of jail. Um, probation department with the pretrial release program coming in, providing the information to the judges. Um, so that's keeping our population down quite a bit. I think there are, I think our judges are working very hard at keeping that population down. Um, and again, when we talk about the, the type of inmates that we have in the jail, um, we're getting more serious offenders. Um, just following the newspapers, little five, you know, two different shootings in Little Five. That's something that we didn't worry about 10 years ago, five years ago, um, even three years ago when we had our last real Little Five. Um, so th those are the types of things that we're dealing with now, more serious crimes, more violent crimes. Um, and those are the inmates that we're having in jail. And then one of the other things is in mental health, um, dealing with mental health in the jail. People that have serious mental health issues, when they're in the jail, it takes a lot of resources to um, work with those inmates, to provide care for those inmates, to provide security for those inmates. Uh, and generally those, those handful of inmates with severe mental health issues take up a majority of the time that my staff have. Uh, so although we have a lower population, we have more issues within the jail than we ever had before. And then below that, there's a monthly per population by month. Um, and I think we go back four years on it. So you can see how the population trends during those months of the year. Next slide, please. Meal cost. One of the best things about the jail is the food. Everybody loves our cookies. Uh, but that's, that's something that we really um, stress at the jail, and especially Monroe County, is our food. Um, Nikki does a wonderful job. Nikki is our facilities manager. She takes care of ordering food, making sure the menus are correct, up to date, um, get our menus uh, approved by a dietitian every two years. But you can see kind of the monthly spending on the food. And the ones that are in red, she went over her budget a little bit for that month, but she does that because she finds a good deal dealing with the four or five different vendors that she deals with. And if she can find a good deal on something, she'll buy it up and then we'll serve that or have that in storage until we can serve it um, a month down the road or two months down the road if it's a canned good. Um, so she does a wonderful job. And you can see that we do a lot of meals. I think that's what, 234,105 meals throughout the course of 2021. That's a lot of food, that's a lot of food preparation. And this is done for about a dollar and 24 cents, or that's what we're budgeted for, is a dollar and 24 cents per meal. I think she went over just a little bit, so a dollar 52 is the average. That's still pretty good. And with the way she looks out for savings and deals, we're able to do special meals, then Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and give the inmates a little bit of something to look forward to. Um, and I want to clear something up really quick. One of the misconceptions that there is about the jail is that we serve spoiled food or food that has passed its serve by date. That is not true. Now, 
we will find good deals like the school system when they close for the summer they have an excess of food they're not going to be able to use it when school comes back in session in the fall we can buy that at a discounted price while it's still under the under the date and we're able to serve that in the jail so we still get quality food and in fact we use a lot of the same vendors at the restaurants in town of use so it's the same type of food that you would get if you went to one of the local restaurants. Um, all in all, I think our food services, you know, is very good for a jail. And a lot of the staff um, will eat the food at the jail. And I think that says something also. And if you all remember, the holiday luncheon a couple of years ago was prepared <clears throat> by, our, by our kitchen workers, our trustees. And I had a lot of comments afterwards that that was one of the best holiday programs that we've had. So there's a lot of talented people there. They do a good job and it's a good program. Next slide, please. Transportation, um, thinking why is there transportation in the jail? We transport five days a week, Monday through Friday. Uh, anyone that's arrested in the state of Indiana and sometimes just over the state lines. If they're arrested on a warrant out of Monroe County, we are responsible for going and picking that person up. So we will do transports to those facilities anywhere through Indiana to pick the person up and bring them back for court. Um, there are times when we will take people that have been arrested for other jurisdictions to that jurisdiction um, for special reasons. If they are a troublemaker, we like to get them out of our jail as soon as possible. If we are going in that direction, we try to help that county out. And again, that gets the person out of our jail, lowers our numbers. Um, you can see we have a lot of man hours, a lot of officer staffing to deal with these transports. And whenever we have people out on transports, there's always two officers for officer safety, for inmate safety. Um, so it does take away people from the jail doing other things that, that they could be doing in the jail. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, courts, one of the big jobs that we have in the jail is making sure that the inmates get to court. 2020, we did most of our courts uh, through video conferences. Um, 2021, we started getting back into person to person. Um, I think with the technology that we have now, it's something that we are looking more into with getting, getting the video technology um, to be able to do more of the video courts. Um, there's three things anytime you transport someone outside of the facility. You have to worry about escape, injury, and contraband. If we can keep the people inside the secure perimeter of the jail doing video courts, we don't have to worry about those three things. And it is something that we've talked with some of the judges about, and we're trying to move forward with that a little bit. Um, but I think it's one of those things that's going to kind of move at a slow pace. Um, but again, you can see that we spend a lot of man hours. In 2021, there was 3,275 man hours, and we transported almost 3,500 inmates to court of some type. Next slide, please. Um, there is a typo here. The number of jail deaths in this year, 2021, was zero. And the next one should be the number of escapes. And that is also zero. So those are good statistics for the jail and the county. Next slide, please. Um, juveniles booked into the facility by a waiver or direct file. Um, 2021, we only had one juvenile that was waived uh, to adult court. And that juvenile or the person under the age of 18 was charged with murder, two counts, attempted murder, robbery. So this is a person that we really don't want in a juvenile facility. Um, with those charges alone, that's a direct admit to the jail. Um, so we really don't have to have a judge's authorization Right then and there, we have a list of charges that we can waive that person to adult court and accept them into the jail. Uh, once we accept a, 
a person under the age of 18 into the jail, there's special considerations uh, that we have to make for their housing. Um, so that always adds some interesting factors to our, to our already, already complicated housing population. Um, it was down from four in 2020. Uh, so that was a good thing. And again, you know, I think our courts, um, Judge Galvin has done a wonderful job with the juveniles. Um, we don't do as the number of juvenile transports that we used to do in the past. And I think a lot of that is with, with Judge Galvin. So he will be missed at the end of the year when he retires. Very much. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, programs and services. Um, this is kind of the meat of this program. Um, and this really kind of tells a lot of the things that we do in the jail. Um, so since COVID-19 kind of took control of everything the past two years, and we'll start with it. Um, we, the jail has had a program implemented since um, the early 2000s. Uh, where we will sanitize disinfect areas in jail, heavy hand traffic areas, handrails, door handles, phone receivers, things like that. So we continued that process when COVID came in and um, really extended it. We were doing that three times a day during our shift changes. And it got to the point that we were doing that anytime an inmate was out. Uh, we introduced a quarantine block for our males and females, and they had to do uh, started out at 14 days, moved down to 10, and now we're down to five, where they have to spend that amount of time inside a block um, to make sure that they don't have any of the symptoms or have COVID itself. But anytime those inmates would get out, we would sanitize the area, anything that they test, anything they touched. Um, with the intro introduction of the COVID-19 vaccine, we had 77 inmates that received the vaccine through the jail. The sheriff did offer a little incentive for people to take the vaccine. He gave them $15 credit to their commissary account. Um, and we did have several inmates that took the vaccine just to get that $15. Um, so it was a good thing for them. It was a good thing for us. Um, our medical staff received training on giving the vaccine. Um, the vaccine was generally just for the inmates, but it came in doses of 10. So if we didn't have multiples of 10, there would be some extra ones left and we would throw that out for staff just so we didn't waste the vaccine. We did have a few staff members take that, that offering and get the vaccine in the jail. Um, with everything that we did with the practices, with the new equipment that we had in the jail, we had 16 inmates that tested positive. You know, and you saw our population figures. We have a lot of people moving in and out of the jail. So only having 16 test positive, and none of those with serious complications other than cold-like symptoms, um, I thought that was pretty good for the jail. And you know, especially when you hear of other jails that have hundreds of people coming down with COVID. So. I'm getting dry mouth. Um, so that, that says a lot about my staff too, and that they were really doing what they were supposed to be doing um, to help out with this. Next slide, please. Mental health. This is one of the serious problems that we have in the jail. Uh, we really started mental health in 2014. Um, but we've continued to add to that service, that program for the, for the inmates. Um, and I think we probably have one of the most robust programs in the state of Indiana, um, as far as mental health for inmates, especially for a jail our size. Um, 2021, we were able to add an additional 20 hours of services. So we had a full-time mental health professional and a part-time mental health professional. And they are both licensed clinical social workers. Um, and we were also able to add uh, a psychiatric nurse practitioner who specializes in psychiatric care. Um, she's familiar with the medications that are that seem to work for certain mental health diagnosis. Uh, 
and you can see that the numbers um, went from 1,700 to just over 2,000 uh, with the addition of those extra 20 hours. And I'll jump ahead just a little bit to this year. We added an additional 20 hours this year. So we have two full-time mental health professionals. Uh, so I think we're doing what we can, but we're still not where we need to be. Um, one of the things that, one of the, the statements that is in our, um, the Sheriff's Department and the jail mission statement is that no one should leave the jail. No one should leave in worse condition physically or mentally than when they came in. I think physically with our medical services, no one leaves in worse condition. Mental health, we're still trying to reach that goal. And I don't think it's lack of effort. I don't think um, it's anything on our part. I think it's just the seriousness of mental health. But it is something that we're really working on. Next slide, please. Adult education. Thank you very much. Adult education. Um, this is one of the great programs that we have at the jail. We team partner with the Monroe County School Corporation. Molly really likes me, if you didn't notice. <laughs> we partner with the Monroe County School System. So anytime they have school in session, we are going to have an instructor at the jail. Um, it is an adult education program, so they're able to do their testing. They're able to get their task. Um, it, it changes names about every two years. So I'm not sure what it's actually being called right now, um, but they come in five days a week in the afternoons. We have a great turnout with the inmates. One of the reasons that it's a great program is it benefits the inmates and it benefits the citizens of Monroe County. Mm -hmm. If a person gets their diploma, their GED, they're going to be able to go out. They're gonna be able to hopefully get a better job, do other things with their lives instead of the things that they were doing that landed them in jail. Um, so it is a great program. And generally they have better success, better graduation rates in the jail than they do out in the community. Granted, it is a captive audience, um, but the, the people that are taking those classes, they really seem to put forth a lot of effort. Um, and something else that we've started with the adult education program is the Serve Safe program. And with this program, the inmates are able to take the Serve Safe test. I think there's three, maybe three certificates that they can get. And this will help them if they want jobs in the food service programs or food service um, jobs. Um, if they want to work at a restaurant, anything like that, they have to have this certification when they're working there. So again, this kind of gives them a step forward um, by getting that certificate while they're in jail and hopefully they can get a job when they come out. We're working with some of the local restaurants to be able to give some of those inmates that have completed this program um, a job when they get out of jail. And again, some of the restaurants are very positive about this. So, And working in the jail so long, I can't go a lot of places in Bloomington without seeing people that have been in jail. So why not give them a step up and help them get those certificates help them get those jobs and maybe keep them from coming back to jail. So again, it's another great program that we have with the adult education, Monroe County School System. Next slide, please. The library services. This is a great thing considering that the library was just here talking about their programs. This is one of the longest programs that we've had at the Monroe County Jail. Staff come three days a week and they will um, provide books to inmates. Inmates can make selections from our own library that we have a budget line for, or they can make requests from the public library and have those books brought into the jail. So I think the next slide, if we can go to the next slide, please, um, show some of the statistics from the library service. Um, 2021, the total circulation of books was 6,948. And that is the number of books that were actually checked out to a single inmate. 
when you start thinking about these books and the, the dynamics of the jail, you might multiply that by 30. If one inmate checks out a book, he's going to take it back. He's going to read it. He's going to give it to his cellmate. That person's going to read it. They're going to stick it out on a table and then someone else is going to pick it up. So if it's a really popular book, it's going to circulate through every cell in that block and then through every block in the jail. Uh, and there's a lot of inmates, they might read a book every day or two. So again, it, it's something productive. It's keeping them positively occupied. They're not doing anything to destroy, to vandalize, to get into trouble. So again, a really great program. This is one of the few programs that we actually tried to keep going during COVID. And we were able to do that with the resourcefulness of our librarians that came in. Um, we would send the request slips throughout the jail. Uh, inmate could request certain books or certain authors, styles of books. And then the librarians would fill out milk crates with those types of books and we'd take them to the block and officers would pass them out. So again, it's a really great program. The people that work the program, the librarians that come in are great to work with. So all in all, it's a positive thing. Next slide, please. Uh, New Beginnings Reentry Program. Unfortunately, this program, it had a really strong start, but it seemed like every time we got going good, the state would cut funding to Recovery Works Program. Um, with COVID, we didn't have as many people in jail. The type of inmates that we had in jail were not the types of inmates that really needed to be in this program. So we couldn't keep the number of people in the program that needed to be there for the funding for Centerstone. Um, so we have since cut that program and we are working towards starting up a new therapeutic program um, that uses our therapist in the jail and relies more um, on like New Leaf, New Life, other volunteer programs throughout the community. Next slide, please. Next slide. This just gives some statistics about the New Beginnings program. Uh, religious programs, again, with COVID, we didn't have a lot of these programs. Actually, we didn't have any because we didn't want people from outside coming in. Um, we have started this year to gradually work these programs back in. Um, we're trying to do one or two programs a month. Uh, so we will be back up to our four or five programs a day here shortly. Next program. Or I'm sorry, next slide. <laughs> Healthcare enrollment. Uh, this was something that we have done through Zoom. So we're able to do this and we're able to do this throughout the entire COVID-19 uh, 2021, we had 458 inmates that were given the opportunity to sign up for healthcare. And when we sign someone up for healthcare, we just go through the enrollment process. And we're cu currently using covering kids and families of Indiana to do the enrollment process. Um, once the inmate gets out, they have to complete the process, but we try to offer it to as many people as we can. Uh, one of the things with the healthcare enrollment with Bill 1269 is anyone that's been in the jail or will be in the jail for at least 30 days. So the, those inmates that, have, that are staying in the jail, um, we try to offer this to them before they can get released. And to date, we've had um, 3,215 inmates. Um, that was through January 1st. Now, not all of those follow up, um, but we at least can start the process. And we've been talking with probation to try to get them to kind of follow up on that. And I think they're doing a good job of that as well. Next slide, please. Recreation, uh, we do recreation every day or offer recreation every day. We have two recreations, recreation areas in the jail. We have an outside recreation and indoor recreation. We also have multi-gym and the indoor recreation um, due to weather 
different climates, whatever, we can't put one outdoor. Um, but we do offer that every day. And three shifts, so it might be one of those three shifts. We try to do that on a rotation so they're not getting off at the same time every day. Next slide, please. New Leaf, New Life. Um, again, with COVID-19, we had to stop a lot of these programs. They do come in every day, every other day and check their mail. So we do still have some services with them. And again, we are working to get that, those programs established back in the jail again right now. And hopefully they can have a bigger part in our therapeutic area this year um, when we get it figured out and started again. Next slide, please. Staffing, um, you know, I would love to say that our staffing is where it needs to be. Uh, we are currently eight people short, eight. We had a person last week that left and went to IU police. Mm -hmm. oh. so, so we are eight people down right now. Um, you know, and that, that affects all the staff because they have to pull the weight of those eight people that aren't there anymore. So you might see elevated overtime numbers um, at the end of this year. Hopefully we won't have to ask for more money, but there's always a possibility. You know, and I would love to come in and say we're fully staffed, but we just can't do that. Um, we've tried different avenues of getting applicants and we're just not getting quality applicants. Um, quality applicants, if any applicants. And about 75% of the time, if we do have an applicant, when we contact them and schedule an interview, they don't show up. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's not just the jail. I think it's a problem throughout the state. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and when you see that Catalan is offering $32 an hour for so many jobs, when we can only pay nineteen fifty eight an hour or forty eight an hour, that makes it a little difficult for us to recruit good people. So, um, you know, again, I would love to be able to come in and say we're right where we need to be, and I would love to ask for more staff because there are certain things that I think we could do with additional staff. But until I can fill those spots, there's no need to ask for anything else. Um, with that being said, my staff do a wonderful job. Um, we make sure that the inmates are safe. We make sure that the facility is clean. Um, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But at this rate, it's going to take a burden out. You know, it will be a burden for them at some point. So hopefully we can get those positions filled at some point. Next slide, please. Maintenance and upkeep. Uh, maintenance at the jail is constant. Um, we are always working on things. Um, we are always painting, trying to make it look fresh. Uh, one of the big issues that we have right now is our door locks. Um, just because of the age of the facility, the abuse that they've taken over the past 30 some years, our door locks are starting to fail. Uh, when we've contacted the manufacturer, the door locks that we have in some of our areas were never supposed to be used for a jail. So I don't know how that happened. <laughs> they weren't supposed to be. And I, that's a maintenance thing, but maintenance has told me that that's what Brinks has said, um, that they weren't used for the type of situation that they're put in. Uh, so they get a lot of stress and they're starting to fail. And as with anything else right now, it's hard to get replacements. It's hard to get parts just because of the supply shortage. Um, so that's something that we deal with on a daily basis as well. And that's a very important thing because it deals with safety and security. You know, it deals with lives. Um, so we've had to implement new policies We've had to become stricter on inmate movement, um, stricter on the number of officers that get into the blocks. Uh, nobody goes into a block by themselves anymore. 
at any point in time, just because we don't know the true safety of the lock that's there. So that's something that always weighs on us. And then there's always, you know, there's the other things, light bulbs and water problems. And fortunately, we've not had any water leaks for a long time uh, since we got the new water systems installed. Um, they came in this week or they were supposed to come in this week and work on a new water heater, get all the electrical done on it. Um, so just ordinary maintenance that you would have with any type of building we're going through. Next slide, please. That might be the last one. He talks more about maintenance and upkeep, things that we've done. Uh, next slide. Okay, immediate needs, this is what I've talked about. Um, replacement of failing locks. We are trying to get our ASI maintenance into a locksmith school, but it's, that's proven very difficult to get them scheduled into that class. Um, Again, I think part of it is COVID related because they're not offering the classes. They don't want the concentration of people there. Next slide, please. I think that is the last slide. So that's basically our year in review. No, it's ASI. ASI provides maintenance for the jail. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In past years, we've been able to send them to locksmith training so they can work on and repair on the locks, but we haven't been able to get them into a class to get that training done. So we're having to send off the locks and it's more costly to send them off than it is to repair them ourselves. Okay. Thank you, Colonel. I'm going to open it up for counselor questions and or comments. We'll start on the left. Thank you. Um, really interesting presentation. Uh, I think we all recognize that the jail is at the end of its useful life. And um, I think we also, I hope we all recognize that we do need a new justice facility. Um, I guess I, I, you know, I, I know we could spend an entire work session just talking with you about the subject, but I guess I'd like to hear briefly, you know, you may, we, we were talking in the back there, I'd make a few comments about what you think a new justice facility should, uh, should incorporate uh, from your perspective. When most people think of new jails, they think of bigger. And I don't think that's necessarily the case for us. The judges, again, have done a wonderful job keeping our population down. So if they can do it now, they could do it in a new jail. So I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is the amount of programming that we can give to the inmates. Um, we recently did a tour to Hamilton County and looked at their jail. The new area of their jail had four or five different program areas, and I loved it. You know, we could do so much with that type of space, and we just don't have that space. Um, new jail, we can improve security aspects. We wouldn't have to worry about the locks failing. Um, that would free up some staffing. You know, again, I think there's other things with a new jail, uh, video, video courts, freeing up staffing. The way that this current jail was designed, it's very, very labor intensive with a new type of design or a pod system. It's not actually new, it's been around for a long time. But with the pod system, you're gonna cut back on a lot of that foot traffic. A lot of my officers, if they're working on the fourth and fifth floors, they can walk four or five miles a day, just going from different areas because it's a linear construction style jail. Um, you know, I think we need to be prepared to build a new jail uh, but again, the way that the jails are constructed now, and Mr. Iverson went on that tour, they use the still cells. It's kind of like Legos. You put them in place, you stack them on top of one another, you build an outside facade, then you bring everything in. They had half of their jail built, inmates in there. The other half of the jail, because they didn't need those cells right now, 
was empty and they were using that for storage for other county areas. Um, so we could build something now and prepare for the future and not have to use the cell part. So I think it would save some cost, but you know, I really think that's what we need to look forward to in the future. So, and we're gonna do some other tours. So I would encourage you to go on one of those tours if you have the availability. Well, I thought, you know, uh, in terms of the efforts that the judges have been uh, uh, going through to keep the population down, and I, and I know local law enforcement as well, not, not just the judges, have been as clearly, um, you know, borne fruit. That, that graph that you showed of the population yes. over time, I think a lot of people probably don't realize has basically been going down since 2018 was the, was the high point of the population. Yeah. And it's been down. And I, I hope, I know, you know, I know there's been um, some things are getting rougher uh, in general, not just in Bloomington, but, uh, you know, I, I hope still that this, that, that 2022 will still uh, stay below that, that high water mark. So will I. And especially. Yeah, no, you don't get to decide who, who goes in. Too. No, we don't. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, 221 people was the average daily population in 2021. Again, that's the lowest it's been in 10 years, at least mm -hmm. 10 years. So that shows that the judges are really working at keeping that population down. And it is possible. And I guess just the one other quick question I had was about the, the meal costs. I mean, you, you showed the chart from 2021 and the, the um, meal costs ranged from 81 cents to $2.87. I mean, that's a pretty huge range. How does that compare to previous years? I mean, is, are the costs just going up and up and up? like everything else is? I think it's pretty, the jumping around compares because that's what she used for money during that month. So if she was able to get good deals, she would buy extra things, you know, especially canned goods, things yeah. like that. So we would make that month's expenses higher, but then we, it might make the next month a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. um, as far as inflation right now, prices are going up. I think everyone has seen that when you go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a case of milk for us is over $20 a case. Mm -hmm. We could go to Walmart or Sam's Club and buy it cheaper, but we can't do that. You have to have special refrigerated trucking. You have to have delivery fees on that. Um, so those costs are really going up. And that's something that we've already talked about for this year, you know, just inflation. Thank you. Other questions, comments from the left? So I think this presentation was as important for the council and the community to hear as the library's presentation. Maybe, maybe it wasn't uh, talking about a new building, but we are talking about a new building, a new Chester Center, and I thank you for your comments on that. I want to um, I want to note that the greatest uh, point that you made that was of concern to me was about staffing, and I don't know how the council can help with staffing issues. But uh, if you have uh, if you have ideas for us, uh, please contact us. Um, Councillor Deckard, Councillor uh, Crossley, and I had uh, a very good tour of the jail uh, a number of weeks ago, and I think it's I think it's important for the council to keep up with what's going on at the jail. I know every time I've toured, I've learned something new, and it was it was interesting to see the maintenance ongoing as we were there. It was um, interesting to see that uh, programs were not as, uh, as you would like to have them because of the facility uh, that exists now. But the greatest concern I have hearing from you tonight is the, is the staffing issue. So please keep us uh, up to date on this. And if you have any suggestions, we're free well, to well, we're free we're to take suggestions. You for suggestions. <laughs> You're asking that. Well, 
you know, we, we need to be thinking about this. We've tried different things. We've posted um, job openings on social media. We went with some of the web-based um, job search, job engine, whatever they're called. Um, we really have not had any luck whatsoever with that. Um, again, most of the people that submit applications don't show up for interviews. So we don't want to lower our standards. I think if wow. we started doing that, we're, we're going to get some bad eggs in there and we really don't want that. Now, right now, we've got a great group of people and I don't want to lower that standard at all. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to say um, real quick. Yes, we did take a, a tour and I was very thankful early on as I started in my new role here. And um, when uh, Councilor McKim was saying something to you and you had responded by saying, um, you know, I think we don't need a bigger facility. I think that's very important because there is this huge <coughs> public misperception um, of, you know, if we build it bigger, they will come and they'll, we'll find all the people off of the street and just fill it with more and more people. And, and every time I, you know, have people that will talk with me in regards to, you know, um, why'd you choose to be the liaison for the jail? And because I'm, I'm very curious about those things. And before life as counselor, um, you know, I, I will be upfront and honest, you know, having that kind of perception until we come and we see it for ourselves. So I think your presentation is amazing. And I definitely think that, you know, maybe as us as counselors, um, as we go and talk to our constituents, this is something that needs to be presented to the community as a whole. Um, and as conversations as a future of a new justice building, what that looks like, we definitely need to have your input and have you at the helm as well, because I don't think we can do this without you. Um, and would love to have your, I, I don't, I know we can. Um, so it would be nice to have you um, along this journey as well. And, and it's been a huge learning curve for me. So I definitely thank you so much for that. But again, just getting this information out to the public. And I wrote down the part in 21, there were no jail deaths or escapes. And that is also something that I've seen via social media where there's been this thing where people are saying, you know, you are staff or just aiding and abetting in um, inmate deaths. And, and that's obviously for 21, that's not true. Um, so if anybody questions me on that, I'll be able to actively say that is, not true at all. So again, seeing how it's going down and you yourself mentioned during this whole presentation is it's the programs that help. And if you don't have the programs, then that's another problem that we continue to have. And of course we all know, but COVID um, has, you know, dampened those things and look forward to, you know, being able to help with those programs in, in any way that we can. But I'm just, I, again, I'm thankful for the presentation because I would love to make sure that this gets out to the public if that is possible, um, because we really need to start having the conversations and talking to people about this. So thank you. Thank you very much, Council. Councilors to my right, any comments or questions? Well, I've got a lot, so uh, I'll try to be quick, though. Yeah, I, I have 10 minutes before I have to leave. Oh, well, I will just blaze through this. First of all, congratulations on the locks box. I know that's yes. a very wonderful <laughs> thing. It's wonderful. The, the media coverage you got, that was great. Congratulations. I have uh, uh, about five questions here, so I'll get through these really quick. This is not a test. You'll not be graded, don't worry. Uh, first is you talked about in one of your early slides that recidivism is based on failure to appear and probation violations like predominantly, correct? Okay, yes. all right. And well, that's how we determine our numbers in the jail is the people that keep coming back. You know, that's, that is recidivism. Right. So um, the people that are on probation, failure to appears, they've been through before, so they're coming back again. Sure. Okay. I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. Second, um, do you know what the average length of stay is? I don't off the top of my head. I can find that out and get back with you. That would be helpful um, just to know. I, you know. 
it was about 77 days, mm -hmm. but I think that's changed. Okay. With COVID. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. And then one of the, so that was one of the, you know, Ken Ray's report, that was one of the things that, you know, they were asking to look at, you know, is, is just that the length of stay. The other thing that, that, that they found was that female bookings tend to be on the increase. Is that still the case? Is that a trend that's still happening? It is higher than it was. Yeah, our female population, um, it used to be about eight to 10% of our total population. And right now, I think we're 28, 29 females. So it's just over 10%, 12%, something like that. And it's been up as high as 15. Sure. Um, it's not as bad as it was, but it's not as good as it was either. Sure. Okay. All right. And then my last question is on mental health. Um, you had some really interesting data in here about the, the number of, it was like 2,215 interactions, mental health interactions. Um, but do you know the, the percent of the population of that 221 that have a diagnosable mental health condition right now? No. Okay. And that's something that we have talked about or I have talked about with our mental health staff. Um, and that's going to be a hard number to find because... A lot of the inmates, bless you, a lot of the inmates don't divulge that they have any type of mental health issues. Um, you know, we ask questions when they're booked in. We, we go through three series of questionnaires, medical, mental health, and suicide ideation. So unless they divulge that information to us, unless they talk to our medical staff, unless they talk to one of the jail staff, we really don't know. So then do we base the fact that there is a mental health situation or there's, there's an increased number of mental health issues there? It can, can that be counted or based on who's receiving uh, certain medications out of the, the jail or is it, I mean, how do other communities do it? Or We look at that and generally the people that receive men, mental health and medications, we're pretty sure about that. But we have some that their mental health isn't as serious, so they're able to control it themselves. And those are the people that we might not know about. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, since we've started prescribing more medications for mental health, it might be a little bit of a double-edged sword. Yeah. We have more inmates that are requesting medications, but we also find that some of those inmates that are requesting medications don't necessarily need them. Sure. You know, especially something like a sleeping medication. Um, you know, we have to be very careful about sleeping medications. I, I'm an inmate. I fill out what we call a pink slip. It's a sick call. Um, I can't sleep at night. They want sleeping medication so they can sleep all the time. We try to do a sleep study or sleep questionnaire on the person. They're sleeping six to eight hours a night, but they still want to sleep more. So we have to be really careful about something like that. And not only for their, their medical health, but their personal safety. Because if someone takes medications and it makes yeah. them sleep extremely hard, yeah. if they're housed with another inmate, there may be some safety issues there. Sure. So, you know, those are all things that we have to, that we have to take into consideration with medications. Well, I know I, that's a little bit off subject there, but no, I, I think it, what it underscores is just how complex all of these issues are. Yes. And there are no easy solutions. I think Councilor Crossley was kind of getting at that is, you know, a lot of people have these sound bites, but it's not that easy. No, it's not. Well, and that's why it's so important that we have the 80 hours or 80 plus hours of mental health in the jail. Yeah. And we're still not where we need to be. That's it's really frustrating. It is. It is. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will, one more thing, I will always go on tours. So next time you can arrange something to another jail, let me know, I'm in. We're gonna wait until the primaries are over. Smart. And yeah. uh, we've already got <laughs> some things lined out. So yeah. So I will make sure and notify all of you. All right, I know that wasn't 10 minutes, but I tried. Right. Well, I'm, I'm, I have to leave at 745. So uh, I'll try to make this quick. First of all, I want to say that I'm very disappointed that the new beginnings 
is now at the end because those were the very same people that are now hitting the revolving door. If I, I mean, and I'm just guessing, but I think that I would, I look at jail bookings every day and I see the same people in and out, in and out. I mean, I've got the addresses down pat. I know where they're coming from. And those are the people that for some reason, some people in the community think that they're doing them a favor, not keeping them where they are safe and can learn it in many ways how to improve their life. Instead, they're right back out the door. They're committing the same crime over and over again. And it's dangerous for them and it's dangerous for the public. And we see that and a lot of times it's criminal trespass, criminal trespass. And you may think that's not very important, but when you see it happening and it's a dear friend of yours and they're terrified, and if a family member had shown up to help her out, that could have ended up very badly. So for, to say that we want less beds really means we want to, to put those people right back out to fail again and again and again. And it puts our community at risk and it puts law enforcement at risk and it makes us less able to help those people who could really, uh, when I looked at the success rate of new beginnings, it wasn't like 100% or anything, but there was a lot of people who really did do better. And we're not doing that now. We're, we think we're doing them a favor by putting them back out on the street. I, can, I may be the only person who feel, feels that way, but I'm entitled to my opinion and I see it. Um, and I think if you study the jail bookings every day, you have to see it. I mean, I've got the names memorized. I've got the addresses memorized. And I go, here we go again. And, and it's dangerous. So I to say we, we don't need any more beds. We are a growing community. I mean, we just what? A thousand new jobs we're going to get at Catalan. That's going to bring a lot more people. That doesn't mean it's bringing more crime. But when you look at the population of any community, then you, statistics will tell you that there's going to be more people who commit criminal activities. So. Those are, those are my thoughts. I'm sorry, new beginnings. It's not going to be able to continue on. I hate that part. I, the part about not being able to keep your jail staffing, that's something I believe this council can make a recommendation to make a change for. Because when we see something as important, we have to keep jail staff. And so I think we need to immediately very soon, and I don't mean for next year, I mean for right now, if that's something we need to be addressing and it be able to offer a higher wage for the jail staff. Um, and you know, I just made that speech a while ago. No, we don't do things in the middle of budget sessions. Well, no, we don't unless we're facing an emergency. And when we're down eight staff and you can't get anybody uh, that even wants to serve, well, that we can fix that with money, or we could at least make the effort. So I will certainly support that if somebody wants to put that together and put that out there to give our jail staff uh, an immediate uh, compensation that will draw people there, because that's one of our very first things we have to do. And Marty, I, I, I can... don't mean to be rude, but I... I don't want to pay a ticket. If I can say I'm, one I'm done thing. It's, I, put, I gave myself two and a half hours and now I'm done. If I can clarify one thing, I didn't say we needed less beds. I said right now we, we don't have to build a bigger jail, mm -hmm. but we have to have the ability to have extra space right. in the future. Right, you know, and right? I, it just as a reminder for those folks who were still in grade school when this all happened, <laughs> Uh, it's pretty tough getting being the oldest one. But I remember when we had a large part of our jail that was work release. And so that, you know, they were in work release. They would leave, go to work and come back. We needed that jail space uh, for full-time guests 
and then we had to double everything. So that's how we were able to grow the numbers. But um, that work release worked in many ways for the good and in many ways for those people wanting to manage the jail better, they were bringing in contraband and causing problems at the jail as well. So, uh, but just as a reminder, and then they had to take up part of the recreational space and, and put uh, jail beds there. I don't know whether that's still going on, but uh, we had mattresses on the floor everywhere for a while. So it, it's never been easy that jail wasn't built in the way that is best managed would be better with pods and so forth. Yes. So unless somebody wants to pay my parking ticket, I'm leaving. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Hawk. I'll just, I think, all counselors have made their comments. I'll just say, finally, Colonel, thank you very much. This is your old visits to us, and whether it's a tour or this, are always extremely instructful. Um, one thing I want to say, all the people that are thinking about uh, the criminal justice task force and studies and all that, and even all these folks that are, we have several candidates out there, right, running for sheriff. I hope they're looking hard at what you talked about tonight, the leadership that you're talking about these programs, what we need to do, et cetera. Hope they take a hard look at that. because I think there's a good story here within a facility that needs some help. And so thank you so much for giving us so much of your time and uh, the generosity of your leadership. Thank you. Anytime someone wants a tour of the jail, feel free to contact me. I enjoy doing that. Um, and I think it's something that people need to see. And whenever I give a tour, one of the first things I always say is you can watch all the shows on television, but until you actually come in and see the sights, smell, smell the smells mm -hmm. and hear the sounds, you don't know what a jail's like. So just let me know when you would like to tour and I'll make it happen. Yep. All right. As a mom of three, I understand. Thank you, <laughs> Counselor Hawk. Thank you very much, Colonel. So, thank you guys for your continued support. When I talk to people from other counties, they don't have the support of their council or their commissioners. So that's very pleasing to us. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, I remember that. We're going to there. We're going to move on to item 11, and I've got a message here, and then I'll ask our legal counsel, Ms. King, to offer some comments as well. Our council administrator, Kim Shell, is not with us tonight, as she's in Indianapolis attending the auditor's conference. It's good for her. She wanted to remind us that we need to start thinking about the 2023 budget, and with that comes a conversation regarding COLA, cost of living adjustment, and the self-insurance employer portion. In your packets, counselors, pages 109 and 110, she provided a seven-year COLA history along with the Midwest Region Consumer Price Index and an 11-year insurance history for our review. She did speak with the commissioner's administrator regarding the 2023 self-insurance amount, and Ms. Purdy feels this is a good proposition number to use to begin the budgeting process. The final proposition amount won't be known until after the 1st of August. She's requesting that a thorough discussion regarding COLA take place at the May 24th work session. So please forward her any questions, concerns, numbers, and she's given us a little bit of ho homework in that regard. I, do you want to make a comment? I do. Uh, just, I mean, I, I know this is not the time for a detailed discussion of the uh, cost of living adjustment, but I just, I think the, not, that number at least has to be read into the record here for, at this meeting. Um, you know, we have always, as a practice uh, for the council, considered, we, we, do, we don't automatically give it as a cost of living, but we consider the previous 12 month uh, Midwest CPI change as a, uh, and I think our policy actually says we will consider that. Uh, the last couple of years we've seen, you know, that, that CPI change, it was 1.1% last year, the year before that 2.3%, um, which is pretty high. This year, 7.5%. 
Remember, because it's it's in arrears, those numbers are already in the bag. We're not we're not chasing our tails here. These are those numbers are already in the past. Um, it's <laughs> it's a big number, and so we need to, we need to be thinking about that mm -hmm. and realizing that if we want to come anywhere near matching inflation, we just we went through an incredible amount of effort to raise the salaries of our employees to meet. Uh, and it, a, a, an external index, which is already obsolete. And I think we already knew that, um, but this just shows us maybe how, um, you know, how things have changed since then. So yeah. I just want to make sure we didn't uh, Thank you. Uh, bury that number in the report. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councilor McKim. Um, I also want to ask our legal counsel, Ms. King, to give us a brief update regarding public safety lit as well. Um, it will be a brief update, but I do have a spreadsheet that I can show you if TSD could admit me as a panelist. T and is your microphone working? Am I just not talking about it? Uh, it's pretty quiet. Yeah. It's pretty quiet. It's a three word. Is that one better? No. I hear it a little bit. As long as it's showing up on Zoom, I think we're okay. TSD, you think it's okay? And if you can admit her as a You can also join us at the uh, table. Yeah, whatever works. You, yes. if, if you feel so. Here at Center Square. Center Square. Not to be confused with the town square. Okay, so the PS lit update is that on April 21st, first, city and county staff members met to continue a discussion regarding the dispatch reserves. And during that meeting, we worked on together on this spreadsheet. Um, we scheduled an additional meeting for April 28th, so Thursday. Um, and the plan is to work on getting a draft budget to the policy board, which then can make a proposal on how to spend down the PS lit um, reserves. Uh, the policy board would have until the end of June to present a unified budget to both city and county council. So in looking at this um, spreadsheet, this first column is really the city numbers. So I'm really only going to focus on the second column here. Um, so this, this first number up here, though, right here is the net cash balance available to county um, at the end of 1231-21. And the, the 500,000 in red is basically two months of, two months of payment. So if you subtract the 500,000 from that first number, then you'll get the number that we're going to try to total spend down, which is this number right here. The proposal is to be able to spend that amount of money down in 4.44 um, years, which would then ultimately get us to this 221,560 and 78 cent um, amount that we would try to spend down annually. So um, we're working on this with the city still. It's definitely um, still a draft of what we're thinking, but I wanted to at least give you that update. Um, we, during, we did, Jeff Cockrell and I did reach out to um, DLGF in regards to a question as to whether both amendments to the PS lit and the proposed um, edit income tax that the city is considering can both occur in the same year. We got an email from DLGF today saying that they would be able to answer our questions tomorrow. So hopefully we'll have some kind of feedback on that. And so um, my plan is to give you another update on PS Lit after we get the answer from the DLGF and after our April 28th meeting with the city. So 
I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay, so essentially the plan then is that to take whatever budget we pass, uh, use $221,000, $221,560 in reserves, and then fund the rest of that with the next year's uh, revenue from the tax. Is that, mm -hmm. is that the idea? That I believe that's the idea. Basically offset yes. a quarter of a million dollars of, of revenue. Okay. Yes. And do you know if this, if that surplus uh, counts both any reserves held both on the county side and the city side? Or are there still some additional reserves that the county hasn't, uh, has, hasn't distributed? I'm not sure on that one, um, but I can check. Okay, oh, thanks. Other questions? Yeah. So um, I, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank our staff for jumping in and working on this early in the game because it's very often been a last minute yeah. effort. And last minute decision making is not always the best, uh, regardless whether it's finances or anything else. Uh, I was very concerned about the, the, the large amount of reserves that were built up year after year after year. And we finally got the accounting straightened out on that so that we know. But my concern was that uh, these reserves were by uh, the interlocal agreement to be spent only on capital items. And this is not what was needed <laughs> for dispatch operations. Um, in fact, uh, it was just the general operating expenses that, that we needed to spend. And that was straightened out because uh, as long as the city and county agree on how the spending is to take place, it can go for operating expenses. So that is really key. And hopefully this means that there will be uh, some greater amount of uh, public safety local income tax that the, the county council then can direct to other spending needs rather than to dispatch because mm -hmm. that, that should help us out. So thank you for, for jumping on this. Thank you. Other questions? So I, I'm not as knowledgeable as council member Munson. So these dollars, this 221,560 per annum for that 984,000 total that needs to be spent down. What are the statutory guidelines for us to spend? Because they're all within PS lit and, and it, it still goes to the lit council and it needs to be, or, so I guess my question is, what are the restrictions on these dollars? And I would have to check on that and I can get you um, some information right after our April 28th meeting. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good answer. I just wanna cl clarify one thing. So th these are really PSAP lit. I mean, it is under the broader category of PS lit, but probably better PSAP. to call it PSAP lit because yeah. it's already taken one branch down the, you know, the division of, of money there. And so, mm -hmm. The rest, I mean, uh, we may get more details on the restrictions, but basically it's PSAP. It's, it's money that's restricted to PSAP. Thank you. I misspoke. So thank you for catching that. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Well, we've got some homework. And I agree wholeheartedly with Councillor Munson's comment that starting now for our staff is huge. I think we learned last year uh, things get harder the longer. We wait with them, and I, I want to see a happy Kim Shell and Miss King and many other people. So let's let's do what we can there. Thank you very much. I'll move on now to item number twelve. This is council comments. Do we have councilors wishing to make a comment? Councilor Munson, just going to be me. Okay, I have an important uh, comment to um, to let the public know that the Friends of Lake Monroe has completed their watershed management plan. And now we need uh, the public's participation, hopefully, in uh, pri prioritizing projects, identifying key partners, and brainstorming ways to mobilize our community to take action to implement this plan. There are gonna be three community forums. Two of them will be in person one in Bloomington on uh, 
uh, May 24th, 6.45 to 8.30 p.m. and one in Nashville, Brown County on June 9th. Um, a third uh, forum will be virtual on June 15th. You can uh, find out more information uh, at Friends of Lake Monroe website. It's also on Friends of Lake Monroe uh, Facebook. And if you yeah, don't find, don't connect that way, contact me and I'll make sure you get the information. Uh, these community forums um, were held before we began the watershed management study. And they were very important in, in getting this study going. And I think implementing the study is going to be also very important to have the community involved. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Munson. I have a uh, last comment, if no one else does, let me offer that then. Um, we have an election that is happening, a primary election, and poll workers are needed. And, and for those that are watching in the public, your system of elections are run by bipartisan teams of Democratic and Republican poll workers. That's how our state system works, keeps it fair and it's a workable process. That does mean, however, we need workers desperately. And so if you desire to be a poll worker, I'm gonna give two specific numbers you can call. If you wish to be a Democratic poll worker, and keep in mind, you're all working together, the number to call is 812-320-0389. Again, 812-320-0389. If you wish to be a Democratic poll worker, if you wish to be a Republican poll worker, Call 812-322-9114, 812-322-9114, and those numbers take you specifically to the people that are recruiting for that. If you forget those numbers and you can't figure any of that out, just call our clerk's office, Google that, look for that, and say, I want to help, I want to be a poll worker. And again, that party affiliation is important for that maintaining the election, but ultimately, they need people that will work those polls, make sure that people have access to the ballot. That's all the comment I have for that. If there's nothing else, this council meeting is adjourned. Thank you.